the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies of the 13th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. Throughout these two days, the intellectuals and scholars of both local and international backgrounds added their knowledge and addressed the issues of our generation using virtual platforms as we are all connected despite the restrictions caused by the global pandemic of COVID-19. We welcome you for the fourth and the final technical session of the 13th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University as we further explore the problems of our generation using in order to find the resolutions for our future. We invite you to join us as we discuss under the theme strategic dilemmas in statecraft different dimensions. Ladies and gentlemen, let me humbly invite Brigadier R.G.U. Rajapaksha, RSP, PSC, the Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, to introduce the chair for this session. Over to you, sir. Distinguished invitees, students of General Sir John Kotalar Defense University, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, I welcome you all to the Defense and Strategic Studies Technical Session 4 of the KDU International Research Conference 2020, in which the presenters will deliver their papers on the sub theme Strategic Dilemmas in Statecraft, Different Dimensions. It is my pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the session, Dr. Chanaka Talpaheva, United Nations Habitat, Sri Lanka, to the audience. Dr. Chanaka Talpaheva obtained his PhD in politics and international studies from the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. During his doctoral studies, he has been awarded the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust Scholarship, Developing World Education Fund Scholarship, and SMART scholarship in Commonwealth Studies. He has also obtained MPhil in Politics and International Studies from University of Cambridge, re recipient of the British Shivening Scholarship, MAIR, MBA, MDS, and BSc. Degrees from University of Colombo and has completed postgraduate diploma in marketing and is an attorney of law, attorney at law. Dr. Talpaeva has been a visiting lecturer at University of Colombo, University of Kalania, American National College, Bandar Naik International Diplomatic Training Institute, Bandar Naik Center for International Studies, and Command and Staff College, Sapugaskand. An outstanding sportsman, he captains Sri Lanka in rowing, has won medals at South Asian Games, and currently holds two Sri Lankan records. An officer of the Sri Lankan Foreign Service. He came first in the country at the Sri Lankan Foreign Service recruitment examination. He has served in the Sri Lanka's missions in the United Nations, the United States, New York, the Maldives, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Currently, he is serving as head of agency, country manager of United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat, for Sri Lanka and the Maldives. He has authored Peaceful Intervention in Intrastate Conflicts, Norwegian Involvement in the Sri Lankan Peace Process, Ashgate UK 2015, and Rutledge UK 2016, and co-authored A Quick Guide to the Plants in the Maldives, in, that is in print. While thanking him being here with us today, accepting our invitation, I now cordially invite Dr. Chanaka Talpaheva to the stage and chair the Defense and Strategic, Strategic Studies Technical Session 4. Meantime, I would like to call upon our eminent guest speakers in this session, some online, Wing Commander KG LK Kapugama, Squadron Leader ADR Vikramaratna, Major MMC Mirahavat, Mr. A. Amara Singh. Dr. Chanakatal Pahiva will also introduce the speakers of the session to the audience. Sir, audience.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the fourth technical session of this research symposium. The, like the brigadier said, the fourth session deals with strategic dilemmas in statecraft's different dimensions. Though the general principle of statecraft has survived the rise and fall of empires, every increase in knowledge has brought about changes in the political, economic, and social structure. John Boyd, or first Baron John Boyd, Scottish teacher, medical doctor, biologist, nutritional physiologist, politician, and business person. To this statement, I will add one more, the changes in the military structure as well. The overarching theme of this conference is holistic approach to national growth and security. This, in essence, encompasses everything a nation strives for. This particular technical session is focused upon strategic dilemmas in statecrafts, different dimensions. So let's deconstruct and simplify the theme to understand what it entails. Strategic means in identification of long-term or overall aims and interests in the means to achieve them. Dilemmas about the difficult choices that has to be made between two or more alternatives. Statecrafts in the skillful management of affairs of the state, then different dimensions, looking at different aspects or looking from uh, different angles. So what we are doing is looking at different aspects or looking from different angles about the difficult choices that has to be made between two or more alternatives in identification of long-term or overall aims and interests and the means in achieving them in the skillful management of the affairs of the state. Development has brought about its own share of problems to all of us. Increase in population, environmental degradation, misuse of new technology, so on and so forth. The world is developing at a rapid pace and sometimes if we don't keep abreast with new technology, we might lose a competitive advantage or even the ability to be in the competition with the rest of the world. In a globalized world, we cannot live in isolation. Considering all this, I would say that today's theme is very opportune. It provides us the opportunity to identify some of the issues we are facing or we can face in the future. This will hopefully raise a discourse for the policymakers to take note of and I believe will also act as a catalyst for further research. In this session, four papers will be presented. They cover varied fields, but I would say are interconnected. Two will focus on the using of new digital technology that has emerged with the fourth industrial revolution. One will discuss the modernizing of the Sri Lankan military, while other will focus on the usage of big data analytics to meet the country's digital defense requirements. The third paper will discuss threats emerging from possible negligent release of chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear and explosive agents used in medical and industrial institutions to the environment thus covering the dimensions of health and safety, solid or hazardous waste management, and also how it can uh, have an effect on the national security. The fourth paper will discuss importance of food security and its bearing on the national security of the country. Now I will go on to introduce the presenters today. And the first paper, is presented by Wing Commander KD, KGLK Kapugama. He's a qualified flying instructor for SLA fast jet fighters and VIP aircrafts. Has completed his BS in Defense Studies, postgraduate diploma in Defense Management from University of Kalania, Sri Lanka, Masters from University of Columbus, Sri Lanka, Masters in Military Sciences, MMS China, and past Staff College BS in China. He also completed his PhD from Maharishi University of Information Technology. His paper is titled Metamorphosing Sri Lankan Old School Military Thoughts by Incorporating Artificial Intelligence to Face the New Normalities. I call upon Wing Commander Kapugama to present his paper.
the chair of the conference, uh, uh, the faculty team, officers, uh, cadets, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In the next few minutes, I will play a couple of pieces of music. I want you to see if you recognize it. Without further ado, let's listen to the first piece of music. This is the sound of a modem trying to connect to the internet in the late 1980s and in early 1990s. It had a speed of 56.6 kilobytes of return, which roughly translates to it being 20,000 times more than in this way. But to have such a thing in that era was something extraordinary. Now let's listen to the second bit of music. from a very popular game that many of you will recognize. It is a game called Angry Birds. The game has been downloaded 1 billion times with approximately 263 million active users. If we translate it into practical data, it would translate to 50% of all the devices that are coming to exist in the future. We will further break it down into the fact that the game is being played 20, 200 million minutes per day and 200 million minutes can be quantified into 380 years per day that this game is being played and that is just only a game. We can use every bird as a statistical example of our daily activities as we consider the growth and activities of the internet from when the internet become publicly available to now. The internet has grown 1000%. It doesn't really matter whether you are a boomer, millennial, or belong to generation X, Y, or Z. The fact remains that the internet has expanded its use and utility in unprecedented ways. You, me, and people you have never met, we are all part of it. The internet connects all of us and has the power to level the playing field. Looking at our internet connects us first and ahead. I'm going to discuss the destination that all of us have arrived at, even if we do not realize that we are here and that is the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution occurred when the steam engine was introduced. And with that, manufacturing dominated the era along with the transportation change in the way communities and nations interacted and connected. The second industrial revolution saw the expansion of electricity coal and steel, which allowed for mass production. The third industrial revolution came in the late 1940s and 50s, which brought on an era of automation that led to robotics, trans systems, and microsystems. And the continuous evolution of these first, second, and third evolutions have brought us to where we all find ourselves today. The fourth industrial revolution, or referred to as Industry 4.0, zero. It speeds ahead the cyber physical systems where man and machine exist and interact with it. Then it is up to all of us to navigate wisely as the fourth idea can bring us smart cities that reduce poverty while enhancing standard of living, sustainable energy sources, environmental protect, uh, protection, more inclusive government process, show social cohesiveness and cooperation, and even make us healthy. The ultimate, uh, the ultimate point is to say that this revolution will go ahead in spite of what you and I will do. Therefore, it is up to us to learn about it and ensure that we are part of that journey so that it becomes part of our global community inclusive. It is indeed evident that the rapid advancements in technology have shaped the nature of military operations and weapon system capabilities develop. Information and cyber technology are unleashing the proliferation of non-conventional warfare and capabilities. 
Psychomorphia have proven to be effective over making in achieving military objectives, such non traditional threats. Uh, such non uh, traditional capabilities have a low value to entry and are attractive solutions for both state and non state organizations. Conventional militaries still have to adopt fundamentally different capability development strategies and incorporate innovative solutions to confront the evolving technological and security aspects. The technological breakthroughs that are being witnessed are primarily driven by the ongoing wave of fourth industrial revolution or 4IR. The 4IR marks the dawn of a new age for modern society, including the military. Technological advancements driven by the fourth IR will increasingly blur the lines between physical, digital, and biological spheres. The 4IR is poised to disrupt all aspects of society including military. However, disruptive technological advances pushed forth by FOIR also provide vast opportunities for militaries to sharpen its operational edge, resulting in augmenting the national security of crime. The FOIR is set to disrupt all aspects of the society, including military. Uh, however, disruptive technological advances pushed forth by FOIR also provide vast opportunities for militaries. Uh, to sharpen its operation with it. This presentation will first identify the key developments of OIA and study how the third world countries can ride the OIA wave in its future national security transformation. Use of technology as a force multiplier is critical in giving the armed forces a qualified edge. To this end, our military forces have been innovating the adaptive technologies to overcome limitations and constraints by doing more with less. As our potential adversaries develop new and even non conventional capabilities, our military forces must continue to adopt game changing technologies and new fighting process. The lines between man and machine, real world and virtual reality, are no longer as clearly defined. The innovations and changes brought about by the OER will create waves of disruption affecting the existing society structures including military structures, while reshaping military, military concept of operations. Among the various disruptive technological advances and new concepts driven by OIR are Internet of Things, that is IoT, 3D printing, system of systems, that is SOS, or augmented reality or virtual reality, and also the artificial, artificial intelligence processes, the greatest promise to enhance and also fundamentally change the forces concept of operations. Innovative adaptation and adoption of these disruptive technologies and concepts will keep the Sri Lankan military forces at the leading edge in operations, training, engineering, and logistics. Internet of Thing is the concept of connecting any device with and on and off switch to the internet. This includes everything from office appliance, appliances, home appliances, personal wearable devices, and almost anything else that can be connected to the internet. With the proliferation of IoT, the human interaction with devices will be fundamentally altered. The interaction will shift away from a human design, human command, device execute relationship. That is basically becoming autom automated. IoT will allow demands for spares and munitions, especially in military ops to readily transmit to supply chain nodes, allowing logistics and supply plans to be optimized. IoT will allow technical map functions and munition consumption details to be relayed to the supply chain nodes with the equipment that is still at cover. Allowing spares and munitions to be pre-positioned even before the equipment comes to the service or utility. This technology is being utilized today by aircraft like f 35 the emergence of 3D printing is a significant breakthrough for the engineering domain. 3D printing has provided the cost effective means to meet supply demand expeditiously. This will not only reduce demand lag time, it also significantly enhances equipment availability and break down supply related costs, such as cost of maintenance of wires. 
or system of system is a collection of class oriented or dedicated systems that pull the resources and capabilities together to create a new, more complex system, which offers more functionality and performance rather than simply providing the sum of the consumer system. In the fourth IR, in four IR, multi parallel parallel developments are unconsidered, and this can be largely attributed to and driven by the immense computing power available today. Augmented reality and artificial intelligence are some of the four year developments that will build the You got one minute more. Between the physical, uh, digital, and biological spheres. AI is a technology that superimposes a computer uh, generated image on a user's visual. AI will also enhance the orient and design phases in the observed orient uh, phase. That is a CUDA mode. Digital processes during the orient phase. AI can be applied to the process of big data and derive accurately uh, accurate uh, decisions. Uh, finally, if I move on to the final part of my presentation, our national security concerns must orient itself to its way of life and adopt to capitalize on the provided opportunities to maintain its qualified days. To this end, our increase must remain cognizant of the impact and disruption brought by FOIA by seeking to foster a strong culture of innovation and strengthen cooperation with the Indian government. This will ensure that the forces, organization, structure, processing, operating concepts, and workforce are best positioned to write the fourth, uh, write the way of the FOIA, keeping our national security at the leading edge. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I have concluded my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wing Commander. Thank you. Our, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. He's squadron leader Daham Vikramaratna. He's a serving Air Force officer holding BSc management, postgraduate diploma in defense management from KDU. He's a pioneer member of the Sri Lanka Air Force, CBRNE, that's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive squadron. He's a chemical weapons instructor and qualified in basic, advanced, and instructor level of chemical warfare under the OPCW, that's Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. His paper is titled, Emerging CBRNE Threat from Industrial and Medical Fields to the National Security of Sri Lanka. I now call, call upon squadron leader Vikramaratna to present his paper. Uh, chairperson, distinguished guest, and ladies and gentlemen, Good afternoon. Now, within the next 10 minutes or so, I will be presenting my research work under the title of Emerging CBR Threats from Industries and Medical Fields to the National Security of Sri Lanka. The sequence of my presentation is as shown on the screen. The contemporary terrorist models of operandi have a tendency to cause severe damage to the society by using methods which security forces are less prepared to face. CBRNE agents can be used for destructive purposes by the terrorist elements at unexpected times. Further, accidental or deliberate discharging of CBRNE agents due to negligence from industries and medical firms can also result, can also result in devastating impact on the society. Many nations have adopted several measures to encounter CBRNE threats. Unlike other countries in the world, it remains a question as to whether Sri Lanka has paid sufficient attention for the imaging CBRNE threat. CBRNE agents are used for peaceful purposes such as medical treatments, manufacturing process, agriculture, and food processing by various industry stakeholders in Sri Lanka. However, several incidents have been reported due to accidents and mishandling of CBRNE agents and ended with loss of lives around the globe. The main objective of this research is to study the imaging CBRNE threat to the national security from industries and medical fields. The specific objectives are to identify the types and potential dangers of CBRNE agents used in Sri Lanka for industrial and medical purposes, identify potential ways of CBRNE proliferation in Sri Lanka, to propose recommendations to terminate potential proliferation. The structure of my study was segmented into six steps, namely, the literature review, identify research gap, and formulate the research problem, design, data collection, data analysis, finding, conclusions, and final recommendations. 
The theory of defense in depth were used as a theoretical framework for the research. The purposive sampling method were used and eight participants were selected for semi-structured interviews for more precise work. Three foreign CBRNA experts were selected along with the five key appointment holders who were responsible for the CBRNA issues in Sri Lanka. In addition to that, two focus group interviews were conducted with the participation of 16 CBRNA first responders and the instructors. The thematic analysis was used to analyze the data. During the initial analysis, three global themes were identified as terrorism, incidents, and regulatory frameworks, which were directly influenced to the national security of Sri Lanka in terms of emerging CBRNA threats. The global theme terrorism consisted of three organizing themes, namely sabotage, extremism, and and illegal activities, both organizing themes are further divided into several basic themes. The global theme incidents consist of two organizing themes, such as human errors and emergencies, and further divided into several basic themes. The global theme regulation framework consists of three organizing themes, namely regulations, procedures, and bureaucracy, and further divided into several basic themes. Based on the collected data, several findings were made during the analysis. It was revealed that the radiological agents, namely about 60, used in cancer treatment and mineralization. The chemicals, namely ethanol, calcium nitrate, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and range of chemicals are used in industries and agriculture sector in Sri Lanka. CBRNA agents can enter into human body through inhalation in this Most of the CBRNA agents possess potential hazards for the humans. The terrorism and incidents are the direct threats and loopholes in the regulatory framework provide favorable space for the same. The national security of the nation can be threatened by the terrorism. The use of CBRNA agents for the terrorist activities will be the worst case can ever be happen. CBRN terrorism can be exercised in several forms such as extremism, illegal activities and sabotage. CBRN agents are highly vulnerable to be used in sabotage activities. Radiological materials are highly vulnerable for hijack and steal during the transportation. Information security in the sensitive data are found as very important aspects as CBRNA agents are concerned. Human errors and emergencies were main supplementary factors leading to the CBRNA incidents. Variable patterns of the workers are leading to CBRNA incidents. CBRNA emergencies can be occurred due to natural disaster, siting, maintenance, so storing, and during the transportation. The regulatory framework is a key factor of controlling CBRNA events with the, with the country, hence the requirement of a strong regulatory framework is utmost essential. The professionalism and awareness about the consequences of unwanted radiation exposure was the key factor for the strict adherence to the SOPs and the standards. With that, I will move to the, the recommendation of my presentation. Findings of the current study reveal that the terrorism and incidents are the direct threats and the group force in the regulatory framework provide favorable space and influence to the national security of Sri Lanka in terms of emerging CBRNA threats. Hence, following recommendations have been made considering the findings of the research. To utilize the state intelligence network for early identification of extremist, legal, and sabotage activities which may lead to the CBRN terrorism. To conduct comprehensive security investigation prior to enlisting sensitive CBRN occupations and periodical security investigations on existing employees. To establish 24 hour CCTV monitoring system for hazardous chemical stores 
and this requirement need to be promulgated as law. To conduct random checks in order to scrutinize small scale laboratory facilities. To provide adequate security for the radioactive material stores at harbor and the airport. To establish mechanism for sharing sensitive data in a need to know basis. Industries are to be encouraged not to utilize temporary or hired manpower for high risk jobs. Employees are to be continuously educated regarding the workplace hazards and safety measures and regular monitoring the same. Authorities are to be more concerned on hazardous aspects prior to issuing licenses for the siting of new CBI and associated industries. Reviewing the interport trade policy and all allowing local authorities to check important consignment prior to entering to the country. Issuing of sufficient personal dosimeters for the private sector radiation workers. To establish multi-organizational committee under the Ministry of Defense for stakeholders in CBRN field in order to coordinate and mutual understanding between the leading elements of Sri Lanka. To conduct research focusing on existing CBR images response capabilities in Sri Lanka. This study is focused on the entire CBR spectrum. Therefore, it is recommended to con conduct term specific researches for the touch, the minute details. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, I am going to conclude my presentation. So Sri Lanka is a vulnerable for CBR incidents due to terrorism, human errors, and possible industrial emergencies. The regulatory framework has to play a major role in this concern. CBR incidents may lead to unrecoverable damages, in particular, as well as the consequences have to bear the entire country. Being an island nation, Sri Lanka can utilize that advantage positively to mitigate CBR incidents. The responding for a CBR emergency is a challenging task and required special equipment, well trained troops. Therefore, it is a mandate to any nation to prevent the CBR incidents and protect the nation. Hence, this is an appropriate time to research and implement initial precautionary methods to save the nation from dangerous incidents that can take place in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Squadron Leader Vikramaratna. Our next presenter is Major MMC Mirahavat. His first degree in military studies at Sri Lanka Military Academy, Dintalava, lying with Sabaragama University, and master's degree uh, in security and strategic studies from KDU. He has been officer commanding Special Forces, Sri Lanka Army, with more than 19 years of experience. Uh, his paper has also been co-authored by S. Satis Mohan. The paper is titled Food Security and Its Impact on National Security of Sri Lanka. Now I call upon Major Mirihavata to make his presentation. Security and its impact on national security of Sri Lanka. I am Major Mirihavata from Sri Lanka Army Special Forces. Food as an essential ingredient of human survival has always played in an important role in interstate relation and diplomatic practice. It has been used as a medium of projecting influence, identity and message that express friendship or hostility. Introduction. World Secret Dimension has been changed in various occasions in history, particularly with 9-11 attack. That dimension has significantly changed as traditional and non-traditional security. The non-traditional security is mainly based on human security. Considering the factors which are affecting the human security, food is the primary and decisive factor. Considering the Sri Lankan foods pattern, Sri Lanka is the unique nation that consumes staple food of rice and curry, which always cook with coconut products. Objective of the studies. So in this research, I was analyzing the subject on three main 
primary objectives identify the situation on the food production and individual satisfaction related to national security of sri lanka identify the existing internal and external threat of sri lanka's food security related to practice of the government importing food items for low rates access the impact of food security for the national security of sri lanka methodology since these factors always depend on the society i was selecting mixed research method combined both qualitative and quantitative data qualitative primary data key informative interviews focus group structural and semi structural questionnaire such as farmers intermediate sellers retailers government and private sector employers doctors university lecturers trade union leaders policy makers and military experts second data books journal articles report news item e sources qualitative data multiple sources relevant to research questions such as data and statistics and data presentation and the data gathering was carried out in three phases as phase 1 sample of 40 personnel from the ground level in society like farmers intermediate sellers government and private sector employees phase 2 10 personal sample from the upper level in the society like doctors policy makers trade union leaders lecturers of universities and military leaders who have a direct connection and deep awareness of food security and national security phase 3 second data annual reports such as world food organization world health organization climate reports and local reports result and discussion according to the data gathered by different level of society the data was valid under four main topics as occupation security labor issues stability of price and food supply important food items occupation and security the data collected from the individuals were analyzed to see whether they had faith their job security in future it was found that all the farmers had the lowest level of trust about their future of their occupation and they believe future will be worse than at present as a result there is a tendency of leaving out from their present job to find more effective and high paid jobs labor issues farmers highly unsatisfied with present availability of laborers so they tend to give up farming and next generation also will not continue farming due to it not a profitable job to be continue a big number of children in these farming families find job in many fields like garment factories secret field and some become tractor drivers stability of price and food supply according to the data gathered farmers admit that they fail to produce a stable production throughout the years due to disparity of supply and demand price of the goods are increasing this cause unrest in general public and they bring this issue to government therefore to control the price of commodities like potatoes big onion are imported from other countries so that consumer get the relief as they can get that particular item in cheap price the ultimate result is that country automatically start to depend import market by creating a new state of dependency on the food hegemony of other country importing food items according to, according to the research farmers are highly against importing food item because they are getting very low price of their harvest therefore local producer always wish to have a higher price of their product but other hand consumer wish to have a low price for the item of their consume the policy makers have to analyze this issues taking both parties into consideration for a reasonable and acceptable solution if there is not a reasonable explanation this will this too will lead to unrest of the producer and consumer in society
policy issues in terminal dimension. After 1977, under the orphan economy policy, fight was given to other industries than agriculture. Industrialization occurred and many factories were opened so that the people were attracted towards the industries. The government from time to time took some decision which are harmful to agriculture. One is imported seed needed for farming, which made farmers had to depend on imported seeds. And vegetation was badly affected due to some diseases came with those these seeds. Farmers started using chemical and fertilizers and is badly affected to human health and it was reason to non-communicable diseases also. So they had to bear extra expenditure for farming and human health. Due to the unrest occurred, people were engaging in protest campaign because of death of food productions, price hike and extreme consumption of wheat based product productions. Policy issues, external dimension. Under the non-traditional security, health security, economy security, many no peace environment as well as the independence are the major points. One certain nation has an authority of another nation essential food supply is also has the power of controlling the recipient nation, which is called so power and it is a significant threat for the national security. Important the significant percentage of certain essential food items from a single country is critical when they use such soft power, which can create a huge price differences in Sri Lankan market. From a slight deviation of the supply chain and it can harm the local image of the government and it can affect the domestic democratic decision of the people which is a huge national security threat. Example, when the period of election, election and situation pandemic like today. Conclusion, there are many reasons for people to lose interest in agriculture. Lack of sound national policy, instability of present food supply and prices, lack of enough labor and occupation security, high rate of imports lead to soft power threats. Country can be conquered fighting a traditional war with weaponry using hard power, but it can be easily done by creating food insecurity in a country using soft power. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Major Mirhamatta. Now uh, the final paper for the for this session will be presented by Mr. Roshan Amarasinghe. He's an entrepreneur and cybersecurity consultant. He holds a BSc Electrical and Electronic Engineering from Northumbria University, MSc Strategic Marketing from AEU University, and an MBA from Cardiff Metropolitan University, and is currently uh, reading for his DBA. He represents ESEC 40 Technology Singapore in the capacity of Director for Sri Lankan Operation. He has extensively written on topics related to robotics, cybersecurity, and the national cyber defense initiatives. This paper has been co-authored by Mr. Ran Muthugala as well. The paper is titled Big Data Analytics, Best Practices from Singapore in the Context of Sri Lanka's Digital Defense Requirements. I call upon Mr. Roshan Amrasinghe to make his presentation. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair. Just before I start, I'd like to confirm that my screen is visible. Right. Um, so getting into the topic of big data analytics, the first point of big data analytics is what does that exactly mean? Um, so everything that we use from our phone, from our tab, from all of our devices, it generates data. And this data has become petabytes and terabytes of data that is very difficult to process. So what can we do? With big data analytics, we can look at hidden patterns, we can look at correlations, and we can actively ascertain market trends that could change our future as well. So data analytics is another component of this, which can proactively detect risk. And I will highlight this in terms of national security as well as cyber defense management. Right, um, so let's just look at the research problem for a minute. 
private security is viewed as an add-on function to defense. In the example that we heavily focus on our private process, we heavily focus even in private sector on our security, but the ability to structure a program that will cover everything, all our networks, all our data is still lacking. We have experienced attacks on government networks in the past and we have seen this. We have had reported incidents, we have had incidents where compromises have taken place and thereafter changes have been done to websites as well as other things during the war. And the final one is the identification that cyberspace is a new frontier of battle. We have our borders, our traditional borders controlled, we have our traditional borders secured, but do we have our cyberspace, our cyber border secured? And that is where data leakage and data attack can cripple an economy as well as a country. So I am hearing this into three sections. I'm first looking at a regional risk when it comes to Asia. We are also looking at how Singapore manages their national security policy as well as their data analytics policy. And finally, what does Sri Lanka do in terms of cybersecurity and what can we do to change this in terms of national defense? Just a few statistics to start off with. We are all familiar, I think uh, the Yahoo incident was uh, heavily covered in media as well, but these are the types of accounts. We have lost 500 million accounts, 412 million accounts, 3 billion accounts. These are the type of losses that comes in where customer data, personal information, videos, audio, their entire lives are compromised. We can see crypto jacking, which basically means an attack on a network and then you take out of the data or get control remotely of the system. That is 459% increase. We are looking at a total cost of 2 trillion US dollars, especially just related to cyber crimes alone in 2019. And finally, if you look at ransomware, which is the newest way of attackers hitting the systems, uh, that has gone up and is estimated to go up to 20 billion in 2021. So what is ransomware? Let's say that we are on a system and we get an email and we just click on this email saying, you know, there's an attachment saying that you have bonds up or maybe uh, your financial data is at risk. As soon as you click this, what, it ha what happens is uh, injection comes into your system regardless of it being a laptop or a phone and it takes over that system. And when that happens, the attacker or the hacker can gain control of everything from all of your personal information, your personal files, your financial data, credit cards, everything is now available to be sold on the internet. And this is the risk of ransomware and it doesn't apply to one country, it doesn't apply to one sector, it applies across the world. Uh, three more statistics that I'm gonna to touch on. Uh, if you look at the highest number of attacks, our neighbors Bangladesh have been attacked quite regularly in terms of the Asian context. Uh, there was a similar paper that I did a couple of years ago on uh, the Bangladesh fraud. And that again was on a financial aspect where a financial jacking had happened and a cyber attack took place to take money out of the bank as well as uh, clean some accounts out. Uh, when you look at the governments and the industries that attack, you have state and local governments that have been hit heavily. You have telecommunications. And surprisingly, you have resource industries which falls on manufacturing and uh, other related things before banking. The banking is number four. So we have a financial sector, we have a telecommunication, and we have government and state entities that include defense. These are the three primary attacking attacks that are carried out by hackers on an annual basis, globally. So if you look at the lowest number of malware attacks, Japan, which is highly technology oriented, uh, from mechanics to engineering to technical to cyber, and you also have some other countries such as Ukraine. So moving on, to look, look into Singapore. Singapore has focused on the data analytics and cybersecurity in several aspects. For example, NEC laboratories, they are looking into cybersecurity, big data, as well as safety and smart energy, and this is a specific sector. On top of that, they have also established other agencies that look into certain aspects such as healthcare, procurements, databases, national identification, domestic waste collection, as well as other new technologies such as shopping technology where they look into data, analytics and buying. All of this is protected under one national policy. And Singapore has an established regional security center that shares information among other countries as well. So focusing on that, you can see that they have a holistic um, framework. Now looking to the main four sections of cybersecurity, there are four layers. The first layer is capacity building. Capacity building is where you identify the resources that you currently have, where you are lacking the gaps and you build it up. The next one is standard adopter. When you look at global standards, certain high-end technological countries, they follow a certain mandate. And those standards can be adopted to countries such as Sri Lanka. Cyber law, unfortunately, we are still running on the Computer Crimes Act of 1997. That needs to change. There are some policies that have been put in, but it's still in the approval status. Cyber law has to change. <coughs> Cybersecurity strategy is at a national level. The final, which is governance, 
both of those are connected because the governance aspect applies to cybersecurity strategy. If the government is not behind the strategy of strengthening our armed forces in terms of securing data, that becomes a problem as well. <coughs> uh, looking into certain aspects of this, excuse me, if you look into the Asian context, I'll just let you all look at this slide for a second. Um, certain countries such as Singapore and Malaysia, they are heavily advanced in terms of the cybersecurity policy. Coming out to more established Asian countries such as Thailand and Philippines, they have a capacity building initiative, they have an operational initiative, they have legislation in process, as well as a comprehensive national strategy development focus. Now, that is a game changer because if the government if an entity does not push this strategy across the private sector, government sectors, as well as other related sectors, including third parties that deal with our country, our data is not safe. <coughs> so, what can we specifically do? Uh, when you look at a Sri Lanka cyber defense strategy, I would suggest the following platform establishment, where we figure out which our main entities are, we identify what data sources are most important to our country and we build a platform to gather that information. How do we do it? Products and services. We have products, we have certain technologies, be it firewalls, be it cybersecurity, be it anti-malware. There are so many technologies out there that work in isolated fashion. We need to find technologies that can be integrated together. <coughs> Standard operating procedure. That is where we have a fixed policy that we can cover and we can follow across all boundaries. <clears throat> the final is analysis and reporting. This is where a cybersecurity center plays a huge part, where we pull all the data in one particular location. Could be cloud, could be secure government facility. I would suggest secure government facility because it's available in the country itself. <clears throat> when the data is pulled in here, we apply algorithms and that analyzes all the data that comes in. If there are particular terrorists trying to attack our networks, if there are terrorists trying to bring money into the country, if there are terrorists trying to take money out of the country, this particular thing will find out which strengths show that. <coughs> so, um, when looking at the three areas, we look at intelligence, we look at innovation, and we look at integration. This is an integrated approach towards cybersecurity. Detect, respond, prevent. Those three technologies. <coughs> so, in my conclusions, I would like to say that uh, Sri Lanka's cyber laws are, I would say, older than most countries. We need to look into that, and I think we're already in the process of changing that. We need to apply analytic models to our data to figure out where our data sources are which agencies have our most critical information and how we can integrate it. We need cross collaboration between private and government entities. That's to ensure that all data has come to a central source. And finally, we need a policy where all government and non-government agencies share data. Without sharing critical data, this entire exercise will fail. <coughs> this is how my references. <coughs> Uh, but before I finish, I'd like to say that uh, the policy that Sri Lanka has applied in terms of national defense is very strong. We have a regiment focused purely on cybersecurity, but if we bring this type of model into play, rather than batting on and trying to cover who attacks us, we can actually build a regional center that can be followed by other Asian entities as well and can share information. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Amarasinghe. Now the session is open for question and answer. Uh, so you can uh, direct your questions to a particular presenter or you can make a general, generally ask a question where we can direct it to the presenter. And I would appreciate if you keep the question short. Uh, try to avoid making comments and observations, but if you all really want, you can make a very short comment or observation which also can be commented upon by the presenters. So, the flow is open now.
Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I was properly listening. I, I was a bit out in the earlier presentation, but the last presentation, um, I think, uh, because Sri Lanka is at a level of a draft uh, data protection law, if uh, the presenter can uh, kind of uh, enlighten us a little bit on how, because I think that given the time limitation, he couldn't go into uh, data protection. So we would like to, I would like to have a little clarification on how Singapore goes ahead with uh, data protection. Thank you. Can I add another question to that? Yes, yes. Dr. Vidhan, yes. Uh, I also would like to know when it comes to uh, getting this big data analytics, you have access to a lot of data, structured or unstructured. So basically, how does this, it's called a big data lake. So how does it, whether it impinges on privacy laws? That is something, being a democratic country, sometimes the civil society will worry about. So if you can touch upon that, it'll be good. <coughs> Hi, um, sorry, I'll just address the first question. Uh, yes, I was aware that there is a law, uh, there was a draft that had gone, I think Mr. Jayanth had been working on that for quite some time. Um, I know that there are aspects of terms of um, cyber fraud as well as uh, cyber crime that is covered in that. Uh, as far as I know, uh, if I'm correct, it's at parliament level or it's at approval level. I'm not too sure how that goes. But um, I think the biggest problem that would come in in terms of what I'm suggesting, which is more on a national level, is the sharing of information. Now, when you apply any sort of cybersecurity or data protection law, it applies to mostly private entities and it should apply to government entities. But uh, let's say the defense forces, they do highlight critical information that might not be shared on a public platform, then might not be shared uh, between um, the different defense entities. Now that connects to the second question as well, um, regarding the, uh, I think you mentioned that uh, privacy laws that have fallen into place. Um, yes, there is, there has always been, I think, a fight between uh, protection of one personal rights as well as national interests. We see this even with uh, digital media, social media companies such as Facebook that is dragged in front of the Senate as well as other entities on a regular basis. But um, let's say for an example, uh, let, uh, when you look at um, corporation, the data that they find critical does cover our customer information, but they are at a certain level where they confirm with the customer. Let's say if we give our data to a bank, the bank basically takes on the right that they will be covering their information. They should have security in place. Now, <clears throat> sharing non-critical data that can be shared with the central, let's say, um, central data processing agency, that should be allowed. But again, that depends on how we apply our policies. The drafts needs to be done analysis needs to be done and it needs to start from somewhere. I think that process is still pending. Hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. So I can also ask uh, the questions uh, uh, particularly for the, the first panelist, the win commander. So I'm so concerned about the future challenges. Of course, uh, we are the global citizen, much concerned about uh, the glo global climate change and the other issues, of course, the AI and the quantum computers. So with that regard, of course, you, you, one of the, uh, you, you have mentioned that the AI technology is one of your areas of interest. With that regards, I would like to draw upon uh, of course, there are issues going on between the superpowers in the sense like the US and the China in terms of 5G and the AI technology. And there's a huge concern about in, in line with the human rights and the resilience, how this AI technology could control uh, the human liberty. And of course, on top of that, how the state like uh, pretty much the China could control the human liberty over uh, the AI technology. And also, Sri Lanka, of course, we are in, in, in a mixer of, of uh, USA in sign one side and the China more towards from the external interference. So with that aspect, so how Sri Lanka could manage to in terms of facing this uh, AI uh, security aspects and especially uh, how Sri Lanka can be a platform in terms of balancing this uh, China and the USA in this AI uh, cyberspace and AI, AI technological race. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Major Mirahavatta. Uh, 
Major, my question is, your um, entire presentation was on food security. And with the current pandemic, there are so many questions regarding food security. Could you perhaps give your thoughts on food security vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic in Sri Lanka against what you just spoke about in your presentation? First, you can answer. It was the first presenter. You're asking the question. Yeah. First, uh, presenter can answer. Wing Commander can answer the question for the first question. Uh, we can't hear. Maybe you had to unmute. Yes, you'll have, you'll have to unmute. Uh, sorry about that. So I was uh, talking about the uh, we need to understand a few concepts about this AI. The first thing is that uh, we need to understand something called technical security. Where the uh, AI technology will suffer for the uh, past the uh, human level internet. So <clears throat> they are actually uh, this will be a serious. Uh, uh, problem to the human extinction, according to uh, several scholars like uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's Craig uh, uh, Kurzweil, uh, Elon Musk, and uh, obviously what we can do, like it is not that we are going to uh, compete with the powers of this research, with research and development, and embarking on like the big data handling, data modeling, data mining, these kind of things. Obviously, we can integrate the artificial intelligence for the uh, big data handling, especially in military aspects. And also, what I suggest, uh, like integration of human machine uh, will give you the, actually, uh, uh, the better options in the future. Otherwise, the fully automated system will definitely uh, overpass the human knowledge and the capability, and uh, it will be, for my understanding, it will be a threat to the human extinction. Major you can answer the second question. Yes, sir. Uh, under, the, under the pandemic situation, in the Sri Lanka, we had uh, enough foods in, uh, especially in the area where, uh, area of Bandarala. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? We can hear you. We can hear you. Please, uh, on your camera, Janaka. Your camera is off, I think. We can hear you, but we can't see you. Yes, sir. Uh, in this pandemic situation, uh, Sri Lanka had uh, enough foods, but we doesn't have a uh, proper plan for the distribution. We do doesn't have distribu di distribution plan, as well as we doesn't have a, uh, storage facilities. That's a uh, big problem of today. The people that uh, consumers doesn't had uh, good access for the foods. Uh, thank you, Major. We can take one last question. Okay, as there's no one last question, we can close the question and answer session now. And uh, today we had four presentations, I would say very interesting and also all encompassing. And all, I think I relate to one question, I think all these things are also connected to COVID because how we use technology and today online things we are doing, meetings. So going one by one, the first one, it was very well presented, destructive purposes, peaceful purposes, accidental mishandling, everything. Uh, we covered all those things. But one thing I found missing in that paper was the, because it's 
comes under solid waste management or hazardous waste management, where local authorities should get involved, they should be educated. Uh, because end of the day, we come across so many situations where hospital waste is dumped outside. We see it on TV all the time. So that is one aspect he could focus on. And uh, about the food security, I'm not, I'm trying to stimulate the thoughts, is one thing that I found was, uh, uh, FAO study has found that Sri Lanka calorie deficit is only second to Afghanistan in this part of the world. There's malnutrition quite prevalent in this country. And one reason we missed out was post-harvest loss, which consumes about 30 to 40% of our produce. So that's another aspect we should uh, look at. Then uh, coming on to the third one, the, I think the third one is uh, on that my question was answered. But coming about losing artificial intelligence, I mean, conceptually is very good. But then what is the cost factor? Then we are relying totally on another country, either whatever the country we rely on. If they pull the plug and does not provide us with the technology to keep it going, where are we going to be? And human command, uh, the term was used was that with artificial intelligence, it will be um, less command and uh, yeah, they say less human interaction. Well, I will leave it to you. Uh, I mean, a military establishment. I will leave it to you whether human ingenuity and human thinking does, is not successful in a situation or war situation. Whether we should always leave it to artificial intelligence and machines. So that's something food for thought for everyone. Overall, presentations are good, encompassing the, our country's national interests and national securities. Everything impinged on national security. And it was well received. Questions were very stimulating. And my thoughts were, these areas are also good for future research. And I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, that marks the end of the fourth and final technical session of the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies of the 13th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. This session comprised with knowledge and presentations under the theme of strategic dilemmas in statecraft, different dimensions. Ladies and gentlemen, please give another round of applause for the chair and the speakers for this session for adding their invaluable ideas and findings. It is now time to recognize the valuable contributions of knowledge and intellect provided by the guest speakers here today in order to present tokens of appreciation on behalf of General Sir John Kutalaula Defense University. May I humbly invite Major General M.P. Paris, RWP, RSP, VSP, USP, NDC, PSC, the Vice Chancellor of General Sir John Kutalaula Defense University to the stage. To receive the tokens of appreciation, first, let me cordially invite Dr. Chanaka Talpaheva, the Honorable Chair for today's final technical session. Sir, please remain on stage. Let me now cordially invite the respectful judges of the 13th International Research Conference 2020 to receive tokens of appreciation for their immense support rendered to us throughout the day. Senior Professor Amal Jawadana, Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University.
and Mr. Asanta Seneviratna, lecturer of Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. Thank you, sir. The International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defence University, since its inception, has produced an immense amount of knowledge through research for the world to see. Your attempt to produce excellence shall always be recognised. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now humbly invite Brigadier RGU Rajapaksha, R RSP, PSC, the Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies, to announce the best research paper for, for the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies for the 13th International Research Conference 2020. Over to you, sir. The Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, out of all the papers presented to the Defense and Strategic Session, uh, technical sessions, the award for the best oral presentation has been, is, has been secured by Lieutenant Commander B A R B A R I Abesekar, very Abesekar, on the topic prospects of improving civil military integration to address drug trafficking in Sri Lanka. So we all congratulate Lieutenant Commander Barry Abesekar for your achievements. With that, I kindly invite the Vice Chancellor to declare the conference, International Research Conference 2020, General Surgeon Kotala Defence University is over. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, since yesterday you all were engaging in the 13th KDU International Research Conference activities. Amidst all challenges we had, we were, we were able to conclude the research conference successfully. And I appreciate the efforts taken by both uh, Deputy Vice Chancellors, Conference Chair, Dr. Pradeep, Conference Secretary, Mr. Sanat Silva, and rest of the entire team, including the Dean uh, Faculty of uh, Defense Studies, the Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, and all deans. Thank you so much, and appreciate your untiring efforts on this. I declare that International Research Conference 2020 of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University is closed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Today's answers will not solve tomorrow's problems. Together, we shall find answers to the questions of the future through conversation of knowledge and intellect. The 13th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the national anthem.
the